All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, actually, for a little bit of context on this webinar before we dive in, uh, we had a information architecture for developer portal webinar uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so this office hours, uh, what we did is we collected a bunch of questions uh, from folks that attended and you know, folks who were looking to attend this particular session, and we bucketed them into certain categories. And so we kind of walking through a lot of the questions that came in um, and sharing some of our thoughts around what are some tactical steps you can be taking as you think about your information architecture in your developer portal. Uh, quick introductions on who we are. Uh, my name is Ganesh. I'm one of the co-founders and CTO at Cortex. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Cortex is a internal developer portal uh, that covers everything from uh, service catalog, resource catalog, scorecards, uh, self-service, and much more. Um, and yeah, excited to share some of the learnings that we've had with uh, from our customers and what we've seen in the market and how that can impact the way you think about your information architecture. And I'll hand it over to Jeff. My name is Jeff Schnitter. I'm a solutions architect at Cortex, and I have kind of a unique perspective here because prior to joining Cortex, I was a Cortex customer. So I, like a lot of you probably joining the webinar, was interested in this space. I was taking a look at creating IDP for the company I was working at and looking into all the, the difficulties here and the potential solutions. So I fell in love with the space, and now I'm here to, to keep pushing it forward. Cool. So talking about the agenda, uh, there was a lot of questions kind of leading up to the session, and we bucketed it into these three main categories. One are the foundations, like what kind of stuff should I be tracking? How do I think about categorization, tags, uh, things like that? Uh, when should I involve adjacent teams? So like stakeholders and stakeholder management. And then finally, uh, measurement. You know, how do we make sure that we're doing things correctly? Uh, how do I know that we're doing the right things over time as we think about our information architecture? And so also lots of other questions around, uh, you know, enforcement and best practices, which made us realize that we should probably do a session on scorecards and how to track some of this stuff. Um, and so we won't be going super deep into the tracking and scorecarding standpoint, uh, but we will be setting up a follow-up webinar to cover those topics in more depth, uh, just given the number of questions we saw around that. Uh, but these are the three focus areas for this webinar based on the questions that we've seen. Uh, before we dive into each of those, uh, kind of just setting up a little bit on how we think about the journey of a developer portal and your information architecture. When people think about the developer portals, what they're trying to accomplish at the end of implementing one is changing their engineering culture, right? They're trying to create a culture of continuous improvement where people are constantly thinking about reliability. It's not just you know, the SRE team is setting some standards and trying to get everyone to care, or the security team is coming in and trying to get people to fix vulnerabilities. But how do we shift left? How do we get developers thinking about these kinds of things over time? And we're consistently improving and improving and getting towards that right direction over time. And when we think about our most successful users of IDPs, what do they do in common that gets them to this world? It's kind of following this, this journey, starting from aggregation, so getting your information architecture right, getting all the correct information in your developer portal, aggregated all into a single place, then assessing where you are today and where you're trying to get to. So what is the final end goal? What is the definition of good? How do we get there? And then how do we give developers a clear path towards that? And then finally, enabling people to do more self-serve, giving the developers tooling, and then finally optimizing those experiences over time based on those learnings. But as you can see, this all starts from phase one. You can't do any of this unless you, you get your information architecture correct. You have the right information in place so that you can start answering these questions and building experiences over time, which is why we're spending so much time talking about information architecture and how do you capture all this information in a meaningful way. Um, and so as you think about your IDP, make sure you think about this aggregation phase and information architecture a lot. I'd like to share, if you go back to that slide for just a minute, Kanish, one of the things you, I want to warn you about that I kind of fell into the trap is I wanted to start jumping in and creating the automation while I was working on my IDP. And so I was moving over to three, four, and five as a customer, as someone who was interested in implementing a developer portal. And this slide really helped me out to realize you got to stick to that number one with the aggregate, because one of the first things people are going to come in and say who are using your data is, can I trust it? Can I trust that data? So you could build some really cool automation down there toward the right. But if you don't have that source of truth trusted at number one, you're going to run into problems. So I love this slide. It helped me as I started to implement. Absolutely. 
So kind of the first bucket here, foundations. Um, well, some of the questions that we received, how do we think about core primitives and hierarchies of data in the, in the catalog? How do I think about categorization and tagging? How do I take into account kind of like non-component related resources like documentation and guides? And then finally, does Cortex specifically have any kind of templates or predefined data models that we can be utilizing to make this easier? And so we'll start up from the very top around core primitives and hierarchies. Uh, we talked a lot about when you're thinking about your information architecture, starting with that core primitive. What is the most granular thing we want to be tracking in our information architecture? And how does that help us think about the NID graph around it? And so the way you like to think about it is, what is the most resilient piece or the most stable piece of information that you know will not change over time that you can reasonably build an entity graph around? And what does that mean? For 99% of use cases, we recommend starting with the code as your core primitive, whether that's a library, a component, a microservice, uh, a component within a monolith, whatever kind of your core entity is that you can then build around. And what I mean by build around is that that component or that core primitive is the thing that most things relate to. Like ownership is tied to that core primitive. Like a team owns that thing. A team owns a service. A team owns a repo. A team owns a module within a monolith. Like that team is con directly connected to that individual core primitive. There's documentation written about that one core primitive, right? It's like the run books are based on that service. You have uh, monitoring and alerting tied to that one service. You have uh, best practices and uh, standards tied to that core primitive. That's the best way you should be thinking about core primitive is like, what is that most granular stable uh, item within your ecosystem? For example, you may think like, oh, teams are a core primitive because teams own things. Teams are the ones that are accountable for things, but teams are not stable, right? Teams change, people leave and join teams. Uh, teams can be reassigned different responsibilities. And so teams are not very stable. However, the service or that code is very stable because that code is moving between teams, right? Like the teams might be changing around it, but that team or that service, it's monitoring, it's vulnerability, it's vulnerabilities, that stays the same. So I would really start with thinking about like, what is that most stable unit? Um, Jeff, you want to talk a little bit about hierarchies and maybe systems and domains? Yeah, I'd love to do that. So uh, it kind of ties into some of the other questions that I do see here. What should I create? And what I'd answer is, what is the business problem you're trying to solve? And this was another trap we fell into when we were trying to set up our IDP. We wanted to just implement all of the, the things that were available in that IDP without first saying, well, what are we trying to do? So once we took a step back, hierarchies were a great way for us to figure out uh, collections of services. So if services are that core primitive, what you often find is that multiple services together make up some larger entity. And so that's where you start to create hierarchies. When I implemented this as a customer, we broke it out into a definition of a higher level concept of a domain. Domains contain systems and systems contain services. And so when you start to set that up, you can deal with ownership, you can deal with scorecarding and things of that nature that are tied to a collection of services. But start with what is the business problem you're trying to solve before you start to create those. That's a great point. And I think as you as you think about those business problems, you'll start to kind of work backwards again to like, what is the most granular hierarchy you can create? Because you can be thinking about oh, you know, we really think about in our organizations uh, about business units and product lines and SKUs. And there's so many different ways you can think about grouping your services and your components together, but start small. Like what is a very reusable hierarchy that it doesn't matter what, you know, trees you create at the end of the day, but there's a very granular unit that you can start with. And a, and a great example of this is a system, right? A system can be a collection of services and resources and infrastructure and components and libraries and all those things kind of flow into a system that is like a logical grouping of services and it doesn't matter if you end up creating creating your hierarchies of product areas or functionalities or user flows or business units those things all refer back to the system as like the lowest level or the leaf node of your hierarchy and so start small right like don't you don't have to solve everything all at once Start with that most granular unit again within your hierarchy, and then you can work your way up over time and then reuse that work. Like that work is not going to be, uh, you know, thrown away. And so you can give yourself time to think about those business problems and continuously build those hierarchies around that. And that flows really well into like what kind of categories and tags should I, should I be creating? 
And this really goes back again to just point out business problems. What exactly you're trying to solve with this, this catalog or this information architecture? And I'll, get, I'll create a very tangible example here. When you think about, you know, what is one probable use case for your uh, developer portal or your service catalog, incident response and incident management is a very obvious solution, right? It's like, hey, by bringing all this information about my services and ownership and on call to a single place, we can really drive improvements on uh, incident management. Okay, when I think about incident management, what are some immediate questions I want to ask myself? I might want to know, hey, how impactful is this incident? Okay, what are the things I should know about a service to triage that very quickly? I should probably know the criticality of the service. What tier is it? Is this a tier zero service? Is it a tier one service? That's a great place to start the tag. Uh, what type of thing am I being alerted for, right? If you get an alert and you say, okay, it's for this component in, in my information architecture, what is its impact? Is this a batch job that just runs every hour? Is this a, you know, is this a microservice that is maybe in the critical path? Is this a pub sub consumer that, you know, it's okay if it goes down because there's a queue of information, that, like a dead letter queue that's backing up that we could go and process. And so ask yourself, hey, what kinds of things might I ask myself about the service or this component that will help me during my incident ma management process? Those are great types of tags to create. So really think about what is my business use case and what kind of questions do I want to answer about that? And that will give you your tagging strategy. But it's very easy to get get bogged down in the details of like, oh my God, there's so many things, so many tags. And like, no, no, think about the use case. Think about the problem that you're trying to solve. Yeah, don't over-architect it. When I was looking at this from the customer side, I think we created maybe one or two tags. That was it. And it was really along the lines of what Ganesh is talking about with uh, SLOs and the metrics you're trying to grab. We had tiers of services. That was it. That was the business problem. We wanted to collect them. And so start from there. Absolutely. And that again, flows into, you know, how do you account for resources like documentation? It starts with, what is my core primitive, right? Like, what am I, what am I documenting in the first place, right? I think one of the problems we, we end up with in our giant confluence spaces and our GitHub wikis is that there's just docs that touch maybe too many things. And it's really hard to understand if there's an issue, like what, what docs should I be reading? Or if I have a question about a particular problem area, what is the right piece of documentation to find? And so go back to your, your granular unit. Right? It's like, what are the components that I'm tracking informa inf information architecture and write docs that directly connect to those things. And so you can say, hey, this doc piece of documentation refers to these four components. And then I can work my way backwards and say, given this component, what are its relevant documentation or given this documentation, what are the right components I should be thinking about and working backwards. So whether it's a run book. So when you're dealing with an incident and you say, hey, I need to figure out how to, to resolve this issue. You can go to the component, now you have the tags, you know what the impact is. You can look up a run book that's directly associated with that component and then go to that run book and say, hey, this run book is associated with three other components that are potentially impacted by this run book. And then I can go and like fall this tree down. And so really thinking about documentation is not just, oh, here's some information in the wild, but this is information that's connected to other things in my information architecture. That is the best way to account for those kinds of resources is think about why would people be using this documentation what is the business use case again that this, this documentation is solving? And what very specific components and core primitives is that documentation touching? And you're really starting to think now about documentation as not just information, but a part of your entity graph. It is a similarly connected thing that talks to all the rest of your ecosystem. And you can start traversing your documentation the same way you would traverse other information. And so that's the, the best way to think about documentation is like a living, breathing, connected piece of information in your information architecture. Um, yeah, for as much automation it, as we have with documentation, and it's everywhere, you almost need a human created index to just the core pieces that you want, and you keep it simple. So your run books, your documentation, maybe onboarding for a service, keep it small again, and have a business reason to create those links and create consistency across all your core primitives. Yeah. And when you're, when you're writing that doc, really think about, hey, what kind of things would this impact and tie it back to those things so that people understand what documentation should be updating, right? One of the problems we run into a lot is, hey, people write docs and they're out of date. I don't know what this if this doc is even relevant anymore. But if you think about it from the core primitive and the business use case, then you can say like, hey, I'm accountable for these three services and therefore I'm accountable for these business outcomes. Okay, I need to make sure that these docs are up to date. And so you're creating this feedback loop of accountability where people are thinking about that documentation as solving a key need versus just, 
oh, I'm writing a bunch of docs and I'm putting it in Confluence so that it looks like I wrote some information No, you're solving something very tactical and there's somebody accountable for it. And now it's a very living, breathing, up-to-date piece of information in your ecosystem. The last thing on foundations before we move forward, uh, I know there's two more categories that we should talk about, but you know, there's a reason we're spending a lot of time on foundations because it is the foundation for everything else. Uh, does Cortex have templates or predefined data structures? Yes, we absolutely provide these things out of the box. And we have some opinions around what are the most useful primitives you should be thinking about, starting with services. So your service data model is like things that people have written as code. So services, libraries, components, data pipelines, batch jobs, that is kind of one data structure. Then you have resources. So things that are maybe auto-generated, noisy things in your ecosystem, like infrastructure, Kafka topics, the rest of the things in that ecosystem. Then you have teams that can own these pieces of your infrastructure. And then you have domains, which is that product functionality system level hierarchy. And so these are the kind of the predefined data structures that we provide out of the box, just because we've seen like for 99% of customers, those are the things that work. And you can obviously extend these data structures if you need to, but what we find is that most customers can kind of figure out their, their information architecture just with those clear data models to start with. Yeah, inherit that paved path from Cortex and then figure out how you might need to tweak it a little bit so that you publish your own paved path for your teams that you're supporting. Exactly. Cool, next up, stakeholders. A uh, couple of questions and themes we saw here. How do I make sure that other teams are also seeing that same consistency and driving that same consistency across different tools? How do I collaborate with others in my development portal? Do Should we, and when do we include other adjacent teams? And finally, how do I make sure that I am you know, thinking about org alignment on my IDP ahead of time as I'm thinking about our information architecture? And you know, Jeff and Jeff and I have been talking about this the entire time now is, is business value, right? Like what is the business value? And I think as engineers and as people building developer portals, that is the question we should be asking ourselves over and over again to help us answer all these questions around stakeholders, right? Because one of the biggest problems you deal with when you're working with many stakeholders is every team has their own charter that they're trying to solve. And that's where you start butting heads like, hey, I, I really need to be thinking about S, like reliability, but no, security is really important. And you start like dealing with different, different use cases and different personas. But if you take a step back and say, what is the business outcome that we're trying to drive and we can work together to get there? that's how you work together with your stakeholders, right? Like you absolutely should be collaborating with other people in your IDP. You should be including adjacent teams and you should be getting ahead of these problems, you know, before you, you're looping in a bunch of stakeholders. And a great way to do that is to start going to talk to other stakeholders and understand, hey, what are your business outcomes, right? Why are you interested in adopting this IDP? You know, what are you trying to accomplish? And sometimes you hear people saying, hey, it's becoming really hard for, for people to understand what they should be working on or prioritizing or it's, you know, it's impossible for us to, to drive accountability, whether it's for incidents or for you know, security use cases. Okay, now we're starting to see these themes you know, coming from our stakeholders. And then now we can go back and say, hey, let's make sure that we, as we're thinking about our categorization, as we're thinking about our tagging, we're solving these use cases for our stakeholders, right? And so that way you can start making sure that their use cases and their, their business needs are solved. And so really the first step you should be taking is kind of like a discovery process. Imagine view yourself almost like a product manager, right? You're trying to solve some use case. You're not coming up with a solution, but you're figuring out the problems first and you're going and collecting information from the rest of your stakeholders and saying, what are you trying to solve? Why are you trying to solve this? What information do you need from the IDP so that you can solve this problem and drive business value for your stakeholders? And then you could kind of take that back into your IDP and make sure you're including that as part of your ground up uh, build up for, for your information. And so start by including those teams very early on in the process. Even if you're not solving those use cases immediately, include them from day one in your in part of your developer journey or your IDP journey and say, hey, we're building this IDP. Let's make sure that we're working towards something that you care about. And so that's the best way to drive alignment and when to include those adjacent teams. Um, and, consist and a great way to drive consistency is through scorecards. And so you can define those automated best practices enforcements. So you can say, hey, we're all working towards the same set of standards. We're all aligned on those business outcomes and we're going to automatically enforce those things over time. Um, so really think about yourself as a product manager and make sure you're understanding those business value. That's the best way to work with your stakeholders. 
Yeah, I would just echo. Yeah, I just echo those same comments that the the same themes that we're talking about in this webinar. What's the business problem? Stay on the aggregate side. Some people aren't going to know what an IDP is, and so you're going to want to start small. Have a small problem that you can solve so you can start to show value with your IDP, and then find your partners like a DevSecOps who are very interested in this because you start to get the buy-in, and that's how you start to get that collaboration. You start to show those small wins, and that's how you start to move along that maturity curve. That's a great point. I think you know one of the best ways to include adjacent teams is to find those immediate, uh, immediate first wins. Like, hey, you know, you're, you're talking to DevSecOps. What is the first thing you want to get out of this IDP? And what is that key win you're looking for? And, you know, every team has 20 things you're trying to solve. If you ask them, what is the most burning problem on your plate? That if this IDP could solve it for you, you'd be the happiest person in this organization. Solve that problem with your IDP first before you go into anything else. And that will really help you, A, understand what the biggest pains are in the organization and what you should be prioritizing as you think about your information architecture and what you should be collecting to solve those very important problems first. Cool. The last category here is, uh, is measurement. How do I measure things around my information architecture? How do I visualize it? How do I know that my information architecture was even done correctly in the first place? And does this relate to scorecarding at all? Like what is the connection between like tracking all this information and the ability to create those scorecards and track it? And so kind of going really quickly back to the maturity curve, right? You know, the reason why we talk so much about information architecture is so that you can then assess it, you can measure it. And you can't measure things if you don't actually have any information to measure in the first place, right? And when you think about assessing, there's, you know, we talk about like these minimum requirements, like what is our definition of good? Where are we trying to get to? What is the North Star? And then by measuring against that and figuring out where we are today, we can find our baseline and our path to greatness, right? And so when you think about that next phase of measurement, you should be really thinking about where are we trying to get to? And again, it goes back to that, that phase around information collection, talking to stakeholders, what is our definition of good? What do we even care about? What is our North Star? Those are the kind of the things you should be measuring, but you can't do that unless you you really solve this aggregate phase. You have your information architecture and then you're able to answer things around the measurement. And so when we talk about, you know, what are we measuring? Like, how do I know that we're, uh, we have the right signals and how does it connect to scorecards? You know, you're measuring the right things when you're able to measure the right things, right? When you think about DevSecOps, they're saying, hey, we really care about reliability. We wanna make sure that people are following those best practices they're going to production in a streamlined way. You know, when incidents happen, we're able to resolve them really quickly because the information is there. And so if you think about, hey, what am I trying to solve? What is the business value? Then you can define these scorecards that track that. Say, hey, are we actually seeing impact on those things? Are we seeing movement in, in those best practices? Are people actually starting to adopt CICD? Are they starting to adopt uh, monitoring and observability? Are they doing things the right way? And if you're able to answer those questions and go back to your stakeholders and say, hey, look at the movement we're seeing on these metrics or look at just the fact that we know where the gaps are, if we're able to answer that question, then you've done your information architecture right. You are able to answer questions. That is the biggest indicator of, hey, I'm able to go back and show my stakeholders where the gaps are based on the information that we've collected. Then you've done your information architecture right. Um, and that directly ties into your ability to create scorecards, right? It's like that business value. Like if your information architecture does not allow you to create scorecards, then there's probably gaps in your information architecture. Like if you're not able to go back and write a scorecard on reliability or production readiness or whatever, like you're trying to solve for your stakeholders from a business value standpoint, there's probably gaps in your information architecture you should figure out. For example, if your, your DevSecOps team comes and says, hey, I, you know, you're measuring all these things, but I don't even know where to prioritize things because I don't know which services I should be focusing on. Let's go back and say, hey, we got to tag things with criticality and tier because then we can give our DevSecOps team a clear focus area of, hey, you should be focusing on these tier, tier zero services first. And that's kind of the, the tie-in between your information architecture and your scorecards. Or maybe you can say, hey, like our, our reliability team, you know, that's the first use case we're trying to solve. We really care about monitoring and alerting. Well, if your information architecture doesn't integrate with your, your page duty or your ops genie or your data dogs or what have you, there's no connection between your information architecture and those tools. And you can't point to a service and say, hey, given the service, where's this on-call rotation? Where's monitors? Where's just SLOs? Then your information architecture is lacking because you're not able to de define the scorecards that are going to drive business value. So again, 
I know we harp on this over and over again, but it really comes down to that business value. That's what matters the most. Um, but yeah, Jeff, any, anything you would add here on on? Uh, on yeah, I would, I would say I don't think you're ever going to have it right or wrong with your information architecture because your systems are constantly changing. They're constantly evolving. You might be breaking up a monolith into microservices. You might be retiring certain services, creating new services. So it's going to be a continuous feedback loop that you're going to work on to make sure that you're getting the right feedback for the architecture that you've created. And a lot of it will be the scorecards, the measurement that you're able to get out of that to know if you have feedback that you need to change. Maybe you need to go back and take a look at your domain hierarchy that you've created, or you're gonna have to take a look at the tagging that you originally created. Might've been good 12 months ago. Maybe you're gonna have to start making changes. So this is a constant living thing that you're gonna have to keep an eye on. Absolutely. Last little bit, when you think about information architecture, it comes down to your system of record. And so when, when you think about Cortex, this is the way we, that we model it out. It starts with all of your different tools, all the different information in your ecosystem. There's so many things in your ecosystem that all have different pieces of information. And so we need to make sure that we can integrate all of that as part of your information architecture. And then we talk about the unified data model. What are the core primitives that we're tracking across your information architecture? For us, that means services, teams, domains, and resources. Once you have all of that, then you can start building on top of your data models and, your, and the data in your ecosystem. So you can start cataloging it, and making sure information architecture is all in a single place by creating that system of record. You can then start driving action through scorecards, prioritization, things like reliability, best practices, security standards, migrations, and audits. Then once you have that, you can start driving page paths and golden roads to, to the right direction. And then finally, helping developers self-serve through developer homepages and different tools that you can provide to your, to your stakeholders. And so it starts with your entire ecosystem collecting that information into a clear set of data models and your information architecture, and then enabling capabilities on top of that. And so when you think about your IDP, this is a way, whether Cortex or not, this is the way we really recommend thinking about your ecosystem and your information architecture is how do you create capabilities and use cases based on all the information that you're collecting in your information architecture to eventually create your final system of record for your entire engineering organization. And that's basically it for information architecture. You know, I, like we talked about, we, the main thing that we want to impress on everyone here today is start with the foundations. Don't get ahead of yourself. Really think about business value. Why am I tracking this information? What am I going to solve for the organization by collecting this data in a single place? And what problems are we going to solve? And if you can think about those things and solve those problems, then you is like Jeff said, it's going to be very hard to, to do the right, the wrong information architecture as long as you're solving a key business problem. Um, if you're interested in more about Cortex, uh, definitely reach out to any of us. Um, but thank you all so much for attending the webinar. Uh, we hope you learned something. And uh, we will be following up with a webinar on scorecards, measurement, tracking that phase two of the maturity life cycle around assessment. How do you take this information architecture and turn it into something actionable, tangible, and tactical? Um, so that'll be the next focus of the webinar. So definitely uh, make sure you come through to that and, and how we think about that. Uh, thank you all so much for coming through and hope we, hope we answer some of your questions. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Take care.